church. It uh, looks like we're going to have a really nice day today. Let's warm it up. And um, so if you uh, turn to your bulletins or the screens, I'll briefly go over the announcements. Just a reminder, we have uh, cards in the pews for visitors or prayer requests. If you want to fill, if you don't care to fill those out, and you can put them in the offering plate as we pass the offering around later. Um, and we'll read those prayer requests out at the prayer time. Um, we have, also as a reminder, we have Sunday school at 10 a.m. and um, the kids club. No kids club today. I'm just, mm -hmm. just whispering right here. No kids club today. Mm -hmm. Youth group at 4 p.m. and um, we'll have uh, evening worship tonight at uh, 6. And we're continuing our uh, Wednesday night Devotion and uh, dinner at 6 also. Looking ahead on uh, Sunday the 17th, there's a youth-sponsored potato bake luncheon right after church, right after worship. Um, that's a couple weeks from now. And then on Tuesday the 19th is uh, trivia night. It'll be music trivia this time. Um and then Saturday on the 23rd at 8.30 is the men's devotional breakfast. On the 24th is Palm Sunday, and we'll have a potluck lunch and Easter egg hunt right after worship. On the 28th, Thursday the 28th, is uh, Monday Thursday worship with uh, communion at 6 p.m. And on the 29th is Good Friday worship at 6 p.m. And then on March 31st is Easter Sunday, and we'll have sunrise service at Horsley Chapel at 7 a.m., and then we'll have worship here at our normal time at 11 a.m. Are there any other announcements? So birthdays this week on the 8th is uh, Shirley Contreras. So happy birthday, Shirley. And anniversaries this week on the 5th is Bill and Margaret Bishop. Our prayer list monitors this week are Barbara Wright and Linda Wall.
now, if you will stand for a call to worship, but before we sing, greet one another in fellowship. sustainer and creator of all things. We come to you today, Lord, happy and thankful to be in your house to worship you. And just ask, Lord, that you will bless us with your presence, Lord, and touch us, help us to feel the love, the hope, and the peace, Lord, that you only you can give and help us to take that out into the world to those who so desperately need it. And it's in Jesus' most holy name I pray. Amen. Now we'll sing our hymn of praise. God will take care of you. Thank you. 
Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed. Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. 
for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with right now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at the Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worship? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in the spirit and in the truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus said, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, who sent me, and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the same, one plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get together to harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come to our time of offering, I would remind you, loose change benefits our youth and children's ministry. If you have a prayer request card, you can Fill it out, sit it in there, a little sideways so I can find it a little easier, but whatever, um, but we'll find it. At this time I'll ask my ushers to come forward. If you want to see how we're doing as far as our mission ministry, uh, you can find that in your bulletin as well. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the beauty of the earth, for all that you have made. God, you are so awesome, so amazing, and you allow us to come into your presence. We come today to offer you praise and thanksgiving, not because of who we are, but because of who you are, that you have made a way for us to have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. So Father, as we come, we ask that you would Take our hands, our feet, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength, all that we are for service to you. And Lord, also receive this offering, this now point of that. Receive it, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom part. Lord, as we come, move in us. It's in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Chicken, spaghetti, lime, lime, what's your favorite food? What? Crackers, <laughs> Tegan, what's your favorite food? Candy, that's funny. All right, so I'm going to give you all a few food facts, okay? Now, why are we talking about food today? Do you all know? Kenny, you know? Why? Because we're going to learn about healthy food? Not really. But Tate, why? Do you know? Okay, food's good for you. Have we been talking about the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer? Yes. And in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. Okay? Now, do we eat a loaf of bread a day? No. Reed said yes at first, but no. Okay? But that means give us what we need to eat for the day. Okay? So we're just going to talk about a few little facts. What was the first food eaten in outer space? Do you all know? <coughs> applesauce. Do you all like applesauce? You do? Broccoli contains more protein than steak. Did you know that? How many of you like broccoli? How many of you like steak? All right. Popsicles were invented accidentally by an 11-year-old. How many of y'all like popsicles? Me too. Cotton candy. How many of y'all like cotton candy? Cotton candy was created by a dentist. Probably to support his business. He got bouncy houses over there at the dentist's office? Well, I need to go to that one. Yesterday, Grammy got you there at the dentist with bouncy houses? Yeah? Well, do y'all know what lemons are? Do you like lemons? No. Lemons float, but lines sink. Did you know that? The uh, What color are carrots? Orange. Do you know what the original carrots, what color they were? Purple and yellow. Isn't that weird? Ketchup. How many of y'all like ketchup? Ketchup was once used as a medicine. Some of us in this church would be very healthy if that was the case. 
McDonald's, how many how many hamburgers do you all think McDonald's sells every year? 14 million? Read. 600? That's probably in a four seconds. How many do you think? Yeah? You said what? 100,000 million, 2,000. 2 billion. That's a lot of hamburgers. Do you know who made macaroni and cheese popular? Do you all like macaroni and cheese? Yeah, me too. You like these ones? The ones that are shaped, the elbow ones? Yeah. Thomas Jefferson made macaroni and cheese popular. What food is the most stolen? People steal it the most often. First of all, is stealing good? No. Uh, hamburgers? Hamburgers? No. Bread? Cheese. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Oranges weren't originally orange. They were green. Do you know who discovered coffee? No. Goats. Huh? I bet they were hyper. <laughs> Do you all ever eat bananas? Yes. yes. Do they come in clusters? Like a group? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what that's called? That's called a hand. A hand of bananas. <laughs> Do you know why flamingos are pink? It's because of what they eat. They eat pink stuff. So they eat... They eat brown shrimp. And algae. You don't like that? <laughs> Do you know that McDonald's once made bubblegum flavored broccoli? Yeah. That's weird, isn't it? So, do you all pray before your meals when you eat? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's something I want us all to work on some this week, okay? Saying a prayer before we eat. Why do we pray before we eat? Read. Yeah, because we want to thank God for our food, right? Yep. We are all pretty fortunate to have food, aren't we? Yes, we are. All right, who wants to pray this morning? Can you get up here? Let's do it, buddy. You going to do it on your own? All right. That's okay. I can help you. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for our friends. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our Thank you. As the kids make their way back to their pews, you may remain seated as we sing together our hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together.
This time I will invite Brenda Wright to come and share in our prayers and praises. We do have a couple of cards that I'll share. I wrote them, so um, we got a text from Kayla Riggs this morning. It said, Billy's a little under the weather, and so pray for Billy Riggs. And Maggie Riggs, which is Madison's mother, uh, she's going through a new round of chemo. It's very weak. And then she gave a praise. Thanks for the baby shower. Thank you for, thank God for you. And then I had another uh, text message just said, pray for the Schaefer Warner family. So I'll just leave those there. We had a lot of fun yesterday with Wyatt. I think he got all outfitted out, didn't he, yesterday? It was a lot of fun. Are there any others? There's a little little girl. Her name is Carly Jenkins. She's related to us, and she is uh, close to a year old now. She was diagnosed when she was nine months with a brain tumor, and um, she the tumor. I talked with her, uh, text with her dad this week, and her tumor is not growing. So they're monitoring her, and uh, she's thriving. And she, um, they won't do anything unless that starts to grow. So I'd like to put Carly on our prayer list and uh, that, um, you know, that tumor, we'll just pray boldly that tumor stays stable and uh, doesn't grow. Uh -huh. Okay, good. I would just like to praise our two uh, the girls on the boys' basketball team. They work hard this year. So if you all didn't hear it, Susan said uh, praises for the uh, basketball teams this year. And uh, prayers for the dance team and for Susan and Eddie as they as they go with the, with the dance team. Anyone else? Are there unspoken requests? Let's say a prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this day. We're thankful for this church, for this church family, for the love that is shown each day for all of us. And Lord, we just pray that we can be worthy of, of your love and your care and your mercy for us. We want to lift up to you today some prayer requests and praises. Lord, we just pray, we pray for Billy, that he will feel better. We pray, Lord, for the Schaefer Warner family. We want to lift up to you, old Carly Jenkins, Lord. We just pray that you will be with her and, and uh, continue to give her your care and your love. And Lord, we pray we have praises today for the basketball team and for all of them students at school. They, they face challenges each day, Lord. We just pray that you'll be with them, watch over and guide them. We ask that you'll have traveling mercies for the dance team and for Susan and Eddie as they, as they travel here from home. We just pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for each other. We'll have love and understanding and open our hearts up and love each other and, and show kindness to one another, Lord, and, and uh, help us to be that way in our lives each and every day. And we
we just ask that as we pray your prayer that you taught us to pray, that we'll listen to those words and, and take them in part of our heart. Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we come today, it's like a really epiphany type of week, you know, that kind of that moment when you discover something that you didn't really realize. For last year, I had decided next year at Lent, I'm going to preach through the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to preach through the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to go up until Palm Sunday. And so I had it planned, had it going, and so we, pre we began with Lent. And little until this week did I realize how God kind of moves in things. How, you know, I would preach the first week on our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I'd preach the second week, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the third week, we would be talking about the bread that we need. And it should happen to be a communion Sunday. God is good. All the time. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. As I share with you this morning, our next part of the prayer. Give us today the food we need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning I'd like to start us off with a little thought provoking. Now I want to ask you a simple question. How much does your prayer weigh? How much does your prayer weigh? Well, if you're not sure what I mean by that, let me share a story with you. How much does a prayer weigh? The only man I ever knew who tried to weigh one still does not know. Once upon a time, he thought he did. That was when he owned a little grocery store on the west side. It was the week before Christmas after the World War. A tired-looking woman came into the store and asked him for enough food to make up a Christmas dinner for her children. He asked her how much she could afford to spend. She answered, My husband was killed in the war. I have nothing to offer but a little prayer. This man confesses that he was not very sentimental in those days. A grocery store could not be run like a bread line. So he said, Write it on paper and turned about his business. To his surprise, the woman plucked a piece of paper out of her bosom and handed it to him over the counter and said, I did that during the night, watching over my sick baby. The grocer took the paper before he could recover from his surprise and then regretted having done so. For what would he do with it? What could he say? Then an idea suddenly came to him. He placed the paper without even reading the prayer on the wayside of an old-fashioned scale. He said, we shall see how much food this is worth. To his astonishment, the scale would not go down when he put a loaf of bread on the other side. To his confusion and embarrassment, it would not go down, though he kept on adding food. Anything he could lay his hands on quickly, because people were watching him. He tried to be gruff, and he was making a bad job of it. His face got red, and it made him angry to be flustered. So finally he said, well, that's all the scales will hold anyway. Here's a bag. You'll have to put it in yourself. I'm busy. With what sounded like a gasp or a little sob, she took the bag and started packing in the food, wiping her eyes on her sleeves every time her arm was free to do so. He tried not to look, but he could not help seeing that he had given her a pretty big bag and that it was not quite full. 
So he tossed a large cheese down the counter, but he did not say anything, nor did he see the timid smile of grateful understanding which glistened in her moist eyes at this final betrayal of the grocer's crusty exterior. When the woman had gone, he went to look at the scales, scratching his head and shaking it in puzzlement. Then he found the solution. The scales were broken. The grocer is an old man now. His hair is white, but he still scratches it in the same place, and he shakes it slowly back and forth with the same puzzled expression. He never saw the woman again, and come to think of it, he had never seen her before either. Yet for the rest of his life, he remembered her better than any other woman in the world, and he thought of her more often. He knew it had not been just his imagination, for he still had the slip of paper upon which the woman's prayer had been written, and it simply said, Please, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You see, as we come, folks, we come in desperate need. We come in desperate need of the Lord to be in our lives, to give us the daily bread we need. Food is important. One of the things that I really got jazzed about was the fact that this is a communion Sunday. Not only will we be coming and receiving the bread, but we have this thing where we bring to the table as we come to the table. And just as we understand how important food is for our lives, it is just a little token of what we do to bring in some canned goods, some boxed food, so that we can send it to the Samaritan Center. In my role now as the, the chairman of the board of the Samaritan Center, I get these reports and I see the necessity of food in our neighborhoods and in our, our community, that the need is greater now than ever before. And we may not give a lot, but what we give helps. Just as you, if you're, if you're starving, anything you get helps. Food is important. On Maslow's hierarchy, I'm pretty sure that food and drink are the number one thing you need to survive. It doesn't matter if you have a place to live. It doesn't matter if you have clothes on your back. If you have no food, you have nothing to drink, you will die. Food is important. And for us, when we come together and we pray this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, what we are saying is that we are trusting in God. We are relying upon God for our needs, a lot like Israel in the desert for 40 years. In the desert, folks, of Israel back then, they did not have a McDonald's every 10 miles. They did not have a dollar store every five feet. <laughs> they could not just stop and say, oh, let's pick up some frozen stuff and it'll be good. It'll warm up here in the desert. Let's get a bag of chips and eat it. They didn't do that. They had to rely on God. They literally were in the desert to pray God Give us today our daily bread. And he did. He said birds would fly in and they would only come so far and they would drop. And they would have their meat. If the manna would fall from heaven every morning and they would eat. And it's funny because God said, don't, don't store up. Trust me each day to give you the manna you need. And so each day they would eat what was given, but they would not stockpile. They trusted in God. And by the way, people refer to manna from heaven when they eat something. They're like, oh, that's so good. That's like manna from heaven. I don't know how good the manna was. They got tired of it after a while. But it was sustaining their lives. You see, we rely upon God in the same way. We trust in God the same way. And in fact, we take it a step further because Jesus himself 
reminds us of the importance of God's word in our life. He reminds us that we need the bread of life, not just the bread we eat, but the bread of life, which is Jesus himself. Just as food is important to our physical life, Christ is important for our soul and our spiritual life. I read an article several years ago, and I've probably shared this with you before, but I'm going to share it with you again, So, because most of you have slept. You probably don't remember what I preached last week. There's an, in this article, the, this person was writing there said, you know, when I was growing up, I was forced to eat three meals a day. And I, there was other times my parents would give me snacks and they were like, here, have the snack. And you know what I'm going to do when I have children, what, when I've got children, I'm not going to make my kids eat. I'm not going to make them eat. I'll just have it in the cabinet. When they're born, if they want it, they can go get it. Because I was made to eat my whole life. I'm not going to make my children eat. Now, parents, how's that going to work out for you? I mean, a baby is born needing. The human babies are the worst. I'm just saying, as far as needing their parents to feed them, other animals and, and things, they'll start stirring around. They'll find stuff if they need to. But human babies, man, they're completely dependent. They're dependent upon us. The article, of course, is not about food itself. It is about the food of the spirit. It is about the bread of life because so many in this generation, so many in the generation before were forced to go to church. They were force fed the gospel. And then when they grew up, they're like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make my kids go to church. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to make them do anything. Let me tell you, it's a sad, sad thing because most people think that we're in a post-Christian culture now in this country, that we've left Christianity behind and that it is slowly fading out. But the funny thing is, this new generation that's coming up, they're hungry. They're, they're, they're going to the cabinet. They may have to go on their own, but they're going to the cabinet. They're finding the food to eat. They're hungry because their parents... And their parents before have kind of just faded out. They didn't make them eat. And, but when they find the bread of life, when they taste the bread of life, they're like, wow, this is something different than I've ever had before. This is something amazing. This is something that, that I've never had. This is becoming my new favorite food. And we're seeing young people begin to gravitate toward this bread of life. They're being fed for the first time in their life. And so we're not actually a post-Christian culture anymore. We're becoming a pre-Christian culture. In other words, people are beginning to understand and be introduced to Christ for the very first time. Let me tell you, folks, my opinion, which is my opinion, it's okay to bring your kids to church. It's okay to tell them, hey, you need, you need to go to youth. Because sometimes they need you to show them the way. Scripture tells us that if you teach them when they're young, they will not abandon it in their old age. They'll come back to it. My kids didn't like roller coasters. Trinity still doesn't much. But Bella loves them now. You've got to show them the way. As I think about all this, I think about goldfish. I know, I just took a left turn, didn't I? <laughs> Not the, the goldfish you eat, but unless you're like one of those people that eat goldfish, I guess. But goldfish, as a pet, if you don't give them enough food, They'll die. But if you sit there and you put the whole thing in there, they'll eat meat, meat, meat till they die. <laughs> Good news, folks, we're not goldfish. But we do need to eat to survive. If we eat a little, and we can simply do that. If we eat just a little bit of food, if we eat just, a, if we have just a little bit of the bread of life, if we have just a little bit of Jesus in our life, 
we can survive. We'll swim around our little tank and we'll just maintain. We'll be like the, the two little goldfish in the tank and one says to the other, do you know how to drive this thing? Never mind. It went over most of your heads. But we'll be in our little tank. We'll just survive. We'll just keep going through the motion. But on the other hand, we could thrive because we have a bountiful supply of spiritual food from God. <clears throat> and that, that we can consume and consume that God gives us and we can just take and we can receive and receive and receive and it satisfies. But as it's satisfied, it actually makes us hungry for more. And unlike goldfish, you won't die from overeating the bread of life. You won't die from overeating the word of God. But instead, you will begin to die to yourself. And as you begin to consume and consume and die to yourself, you will begin to live for Christ. You won't perish in this body like a goldfish, but instead you'll find everlasting life. But you need to open yourself up to God. And you need to allow him to give us today the food we need. We need to come like the woman at the well. We come, we're steeped in sin, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're broken. And Jesus says to us, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life. Later on, Jesus says to the disciples, my nourishment doesn't come from anything, any food that you know of. It comes from my Father above. And then later on in John chapter 6, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So when we pray, Give us this day our daily bread. We are truly praying for the sustenance we need to survive in this body. We pray for the food that we need each and every day. We pray for it. We pray over it. We give thanks. But we are also praying and giving thanks for the bread of life which is what we need for our very souls. To our folks online, we haven't developed Wonka vision yet, so I can't send the bread through the television for you to receive and the juice for you to receive. So I'm going to tell you to have a great week. Live in the breath of life and the bread of life. Live by that. Follow, go forth, allow the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to go before you and let God lead you to a place of fulfillment, to be full and holy. God bless. Amen. For the rest of us gathered here today, we come to this table. We come to a place where we experience the bread of life in a very real way. We see the bread that was given. Jesus used bread. It's funny because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he was born in a place called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And it was bread that he used in the upper room. And he broke it. He said, this is my body. As so often as you eat of this, remember me. Likewise, he took the cup. The cup that was after the meal. The cup that would remind them of the blood of the lamb over the door in Egypt. When the angel of death passed over and all within the house were saved. He said, this blood is now the blood of the new covenant, 
it's my blood, it's shed for you and for many. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And in this bread and in this cup, you'll find forgiveness. You'll find fullness. You'll find holiness. So today, as we prepare to come to the table, we prepare our hearts and minds for that encounter. We come expecting in a very real way that we will experience Christ. And, you know, you're just going to get a little, little bit of bread. It won't fill you up, folks. If you're hungry, you'll have to go to lunch afterwards. It's not going to fill you up physically. But when you receive the bread, be filled with the bread of life. Let that, let the God that we love, that loves us, fill you up. When you receive the juice, let it quench your thirst spiritually. May it become a living spring within you of Christ's life. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these gifts of bread and cup. We ask that you would be, that you would put your spirit upon them so that they may become the body and blood of Christ, so that we can be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood for all the world to see. Lord, make us one with each other and one with Christ Jesus until he comes again in final victory. And until that day comes, Lord, we give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. God, come, feed us in our spirit. Quench this thirst that we have for you. And it's everything that you do. I'm going to ask Mr. Sam McNeil to come forward, our youth pastor. This table is the Lord's table. It's not the Methodist table. It's not, it's not an exclusive table. It's not a private dining room. This is the Lord's table. And so when we come and we say come and be fed, that call is for everyone, everywhere, to come and be fed. So... So we will encourage you to come. We'll start from the back. Just come as you feel ready.
If you would, join me as we come together for our communion response. Eternal God, we give thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have a closing song. Y'all better come on. <laughs> As we come to the table, as we leave from the table, I pray that you leave filled, filled with the Holy Spirit as these boys carry out the light of the Holy Spirit into the world. May you also be filled with that same Holy Spirit, carrying the light of Christ, showing the world where they can find the nourishment they need in him as you go forth. Allowing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to go before you, to lead you, to guide you, to fill you up, and to fulfill your life. Go in peace. Amen.